the psychiatrist had me do tests. And he said, well, you have a very high feminine quotient. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, I could have told you that without taking the test. He prescribed the antipsychotic Thorazine because I was attracted to guys. Six months later, I was on a Mormon mission. So the expectation is you are a missionary every moment of these two years at the exclusion of interaction with family, friends, you don't date. There wasn't anything of any sort other than proselytizing. We were the first Mormons that had ever basically stepped foot in Pescara. It was beautiful, it was springtime, but I could not shake the sadness. Nighttime was a torture. And as I would sit there wide awake all night long, I would lean out the window of the apartment. I would watch the prostitutes be picked up, dropped off again. You know, in some ways, they were more real to me than anybody else around me at that point. I shared a sense of being the bad one. One Sunday, late in the summer, uh, this group of Italian kids came to our meeting. At the end of it, one of the guys came up to me and introduced himself, and he said, that's a rather strange choice of music that you played for the prelude and postlude music. And I said, why? And he said, well, that, that's the theme song from Death in Venice, Morte a Venezia, which is, of course, a very famous classic about an older gay man who falls in love with a young boy in Venice during a cholera epidemic. Gianni was absolutely stunningly beautiful. He was a very brooding, and he was a communist, and, and so he was very intense. Everything about him had gotten hold of me. One of the fundamental rules of Mormon missions is that you have to be with a companion 24-7, 365. Johnny and I wanted to be together. We wanted to be together all the time. That I had to have an excuse. So we argued for hours and hours and hours about communism versus Mormonism. One of these arguments one night got so loud that one of the companions said, would you guys just like go outside the front door because it's like you're keeping all of us awake here. And of course, as soon as we got outside the front door, we stopped arguing. We sat there holding hands, and we were just talking, and he just leaned over at one point without saying anything. He just leaned over and kissed me. For the longest time, and I sat there thinking, Dove sono stato? Tutta mia vita. E solo ora provo questo. I finally knew who I was, who Tom was. And in a kiss, of all things, it certainly didn't jive with what I was about as a Mormon missionary or what my life was supposed to be about. My mom used to tell us very specifically that homosexuals were the next to the lowest rung on the ladder. That murderers were right here, and they were reaching up, trying to grab our ankles and pull us down. We were very aware that this was totally, completely against the rules, and it was wrong, and I was going to hell, and all of that. But from that moment forward, Johnny and I were basically inseparable. I remember many times we would be walking down the street together. I'd have my hand in Johnny's hand inside of his coat, and then Johnny and I would like race behind a closed door real quick and kiss. And I remember one day looking out the window, and there was Johnny down below with all the communist college students marching in the streets. And it was just so utterly bizarre, and yet for me it all just fit. He tasted like cigarettes, and we'd had big arguments about the cigarettes. You know, I kept 
saying you have to stop smoking. It's ridiculous. It's horrible. It's a sin. <laughs> and my companion was oblivious to what was going on. Granted, he's 19 years old. How could he have even imagined that I could be carrying on this, you know, this love affair? There was no possibility to have sex, and we just didn't care. I was happy for the first time in years. Completely off the drugs, I threw away what was left of the Thorazine. The reality of being a missionary for the Mormon Church is that you're transferred from one city to another, or as they say, from one district to another. So when the transfer came, oh my God, the drama. Neither of us could conceive of being without the other. It was a long transfer, so I asked John Nee if he would come along to help me carry my luggage. <laughs> we both knew that was a big lie. The train goes Pescara, Rome, Civitavecchia, and from Civitavecchia, the ferry boat that crosses the Mediterranean out to the island of Sardinia. I was still putting on a show, you know, waving to everybody as the train's pulling out of the station, and smiling, and Johnny, of course, was like deaf. He absolutely did not, would not put on a show for anybody. We pulled the luggage down into an empty scabuzzino, and then we closed the door behind us and started sobbing and sobbing. And I, I just felt like my whole insides were coming out. I just had held on to all of this emotion for the last six, seven months with John Lee, never being able to let anything go, ever. The entire train ride, we were alternately crying and kissing. We thought that day was the end of our lives. It just felt so... How can you be that much in love and not be together? By the time we got to Civitavecchia, we missed the ferry boat for the island. So we had the entire day now to spend in Civitavecchia. And I have movies of this because I, you know, every once in a while remembered to pull out the movie camera and Civitavecchia, a seaside town on the Mediterranean. We have not slept and we are so emotionally spent and we are so in love. Something was altered. It was like in a dream. I remember seeing a horse carriage coming down the street and there was no sound. It was as if all sound had disappeared. Everything stopped. So we get on the ferry boat just a little before dusk, and it pulls away and we're standing on the back of the ship looking towards the mainland. And I just see Italy getting smaller and smaller. And the most amazing thing happened. I suddenly started feeling calmness come over me. It's the day of the San Remo Festival and the music's on the TV in the background. Johnny said, I'm tired. Can we go back to the room? just this tiny little cabin with bunk beds. Johnny got undressed and went in to shower. And I started to undress. And I remember leaning up against the wall of the cabin in my garments, the underwear that Mormons wear. And I had a talk with God. I just said, you know, God, I'm tired of fighting and I'm tired of asking you to take this away from me. I've asked you a thousand times, take these feelings away from me and you won't and you haven't. So I'm going to do what I need to do and that's what I said to God that night. I'm going to do what I need to do and you do what you need to do and that's the deal. 
you want to punish me, you go right ahead. I'm tired of hurting. And that's what I told God that night. Early the next morning, the ferry boat docks at this almost primitive port. Johnny and I lugged all my luggage you know, behind us up that dirt road and up to the train station, and the world was quiet. And Johnny and I knew at this point that it was the end of the line. Out in front of the train station, face to face. We just would touch each other's faces and kiss and hug. And then I'd go to push him away to say goodbye, and he'd pull me back. And for the first time, he was crying too. And he said, stay, live here with me. We'll have the rest of our lives together. This is what we want. He couldn't understand why I kept saying, non posso. And I had no way to explain it to him. There was no bridge between these two. There was no way for me to be with Johnny and be Mormon. He lit a cigarette, turned around, and headed off down that road. Every once in a while, he would wave, and I could see the trail of smoke rising above him until he finally got so tiny down there at the bottom that I really could hardly see him anymore. I knew something at that point had changed radically. It wasn't just love. It was also the awakening of me. <laughs> 